Well, hello class and welcome to our third lesson in the topic of enzymes. Now, how many of you guys like to eat cheese? And there are many different types of cheese. Cheddar cheese, mozzarella, parmesan cheese. And I slowly grew to like cheese as I grew up. Now, I visited a cheese making factory recently. So you see people working very hard. And what I found out from that factory is that making cheese is actually quite a delicate process. And it is a process that involves enzymes. Yep, you got that right. Enzymes are involved in producing cheese. And here's the thing. In order to produce cheese of the right kind of quality, you need the right temperature and you also need the right pH or the right acidity. Get either of this wrong and the cheese turns out bad. So the enzymes involved in making cheese require the right conditions, temperature and pH, in order to function properly. So for this lesson, we'll be looking at how enzymes, like those involved in making cheese, are affected by temperature and also by pH. Now the things that you'll learn in this lesson are very important. You will need to commit time to remember uh, how to describe and explain uh, the effect that temperature and pH has on enzyme activity. Right, so if you need a reference uh, in your textbook, it's page 80 to 84. So let's get going. All right, so let's start by talking about how temperature affects enzyme activity. And here we have a simple experiment involving the digestion of milk by an enzyme called trypsin, which is a protease. So trypsin acts on the protein that is found in milk. So over here, we have four test tubes. Each of them have some milk inside. In the first test tube, it's a control, there's no enzyme. But in the rest, these three test tubes, you have trypsin as well. And these test tubes, they are placed at different temperatures. Now take a look at the video and see what happens as the milk is digested. And also predict which one do you think will occur or will digestion occur the fastest. Okay, I've zoomed out a little so that you can have a clearer view of the experiment. Now as I start the video, okay, just take a look at what happens. So trypsin enzyme is added to each of the test tubes containing milk protein at different temperatures. One at 5 degrees Celsius, 25 degrees Celsius, and at 55 degrees Celsius. So take a look at what happens as I fast forward the video. So what you notice is that as milk is digested by trypsin, right, the solution changes from cloudy to clear. And you notice that this occurred fastest at 55 degrees Celsius. So it seems to suggest, this experiment seems to suggest that as temperature increases, the rate of trypsin or the rate of enzyme activity increases. Alright, so we just saw an experiment that was conducted at three different temperatures uh, where the rate of enzyme activity was measured at three different temperatures. Now imagine if we measured the rate of enzyme activity across a larger range of temperature, let's say from 0 degrees to about 60 degrees. And imagine if we plotted a graph of the rate of reaction against temperature. Well, you would expect to get a graph that looks something like this, usually for most enzymes. Now, what do you notice about this graph? The first thing you notice is that, well, as temperature increases, the rate of enzyme activity seems to increase, right? That's just what we saw in the experiment just now. But it reaches a maximum rate at a particular temperature. And that temperature we call it the optimum temperature. Now, after the optimum temperature, any higher than that, and the enzyme activity actually decreases. Now we'll look at, that, we'll look at why, that, why that happens uh, later on. But first, let's learn about how we can describe uh, this relationship between temperature and enzyme activity. And to do that, I need to first think about how many sections do you think you could divide this graph into? Alright, so hopefully you thought of something like this, that we could divide the graph into two sections right, using the turning point here. Right, usually we use these turning points to divide our graphs. 
So the turning point, of course, is the optimum temperature. It is the point, the temperature, where the enzyme activity is at the highest rate. And on the left side, we have the section that is below optimum temperature. And on the right side, the section that is above optimum temperature. Now, how your textbook does it is that it splits your graph into four parts. All right, there's A, which is the very low temperatures. B, which is from very low all the way to optimum temperature. C, which is at optimum temperature. And D, which is beyond optimum temperature. So that's how your textbook does it, and we're going to follow that. So we need to learn how to describe uh, the relationship between temperature and enzyme activity at A, B, C, and D. So let's get going. All right, so at A, which is at low temperatures, we say that the rate of enzyme reaction is also very low, right? Low, zero temperature, and very low enzyme activity. All right, easy. All right, moving on to B. Section B, which is this part, we say that as temperature increases from 0 degrees to 40 degrees, which is our optimum temperature in this case, as temperature increases from 0 to 40 degrees, the rate of enzyme reaction also increases. So you can see uh, the line moving in this way. Now take note, it's important to put data, so as we mentioned, it is 0 degrees and 40 degrees uh, for describing your graph. Right, so it depends on what your values are down here. There's an interesting question. How much does the rate of enzyme reaction increase for every 10 degrees? Now as a guide, for every 10 degrees, the rate of enzyme reaction usually increases by about two times. Right? About two times. Right, moving on to point C, which is at our optimum temperature. So in this case, optimum temperature is 40 degrees. So at 40 degrees Celsius, we say that the rate of enzyme reaction reaches its maximum. It is the highest. Right, and as already mentioned, this is called the optimum temperature, where the rate of enzyme reaction is at its maximum. All right, and finally, moving on to point D, we say that beyond the optimum temperature, which in this case is 40 degrees Celsius, right, we use the data, what happens? The enzyme activity decreases. Right, and we can actually say that it decreases sharply. Right, it's quite a steep drop. All right, so this is how you describe the shape uh, of the curve, or describe the relationship between temperature and enzyme activity. You need to describe section A, B, C, and D in the way that we have gone through. Now, besides describing uh, the relationship between enzyme activity and temperature, you also need to know how to explain. Right now, explaining is not just telling me the shape of the graph and giving me the data. It is telling me why is it this shape. So it's actually explaining to me why does the graph have this shape. So let's explore together why is it that the graph has this shape. All right, and the reason why the graph is that shape has something to do with this song. So have a guess what the song is. A light shining through. Got it yet? The song is Collide. And in the next few explanations, we'll be talking quite a bit about colliding, about collisions. Alright, so listen up. Alright, so for an enzyme reaction to take place, what needs to happen? Here we have our enzyme and our substrate. Now we learned from our previous lesson that for the reaction to take place, the substrate needs to bind to the active site of the enzyme. Now before that could even happen, first, the enzyme and substrate need to collide. Right? They need to collide into each other so that the substrate can bind to the active site. And they need to collide with the right orientation, in which the right position, and also with enough energy with enough force. So over here, right, we see this substrate and enzyme colliding in the right orientation, right, so that the substrate can enter the enzyme's active site. But at the bottom here you'll see, ooh, right, they collide but in the wrong orientation. And maybe also with not enough energy. So here there is no enzyme reaction. 
Alright, so take note of that. For an enzyme reaction to take place, enzymes and substrates need to collide with the right orientation and importantly, importantly, uh, with enough energy. So with that in mind, I'm going to state a very important uh, statement. That the rate of enzyme reaction depends on the frequency of effective collisions between enzymes and substrates. So the rate of reaction depends on how frequent enzyme and substrates collide with the right amount of energy, with enough energy, effectively. Okay, so take a look at these two scenarios. Uh, we have five enzymes here and five enzymes here. But in this case, we have very few substrate uh, particles. And here we have many, many substrate particles. Which case will you have a higher chance or higher frequency of collisions? I want to take you now to realize that on this side, because we have a lot more substrate particles, there's a higher chance of effective collisions here. So there will also be a higher rate of enzyme reaction here. All right, with that in mind, let's start explaining the shape of our graph. So starting with point A, where the rate of enzyme activity is very low. At low temperatures, enzymes and substrates both have very low kinetic energy, very low movement energy. So they're moving very slowly, like you moving very slowly in the morning. And therefore, if you're moving very slowly, then the frequency of collisions between enzymes and substrates is very low. They don't collide very often. And therefore, enzymes are inactive and the rate of activity is very low. Alright, so that's point A. Alright, moving on to point B. We say that as the temperature increases, right, from here to here, enzymes and substrates gain kinetic energy. They gain movement energy. So they begin to move faster. And the frequency of collisions between enzymes and substrates also increases, right? The frequency of effective collisions increases. So they start banging and bumping to each other more. And therefore, the rate of enzyme reaction also increases, or the rate at which enzyme substrate complex is formed increases, right? And that's why the graph has this going up shape. All right, next we look at point C. At the optimum temperature, we say that the frequency of collisions between enzymes and substrates is at a maximum, right? That, that's the maximum frequency of effective collisions. And therefore, the rate of enzyme reaction or the rate at which enzyme substrate complexes are formed is at a maximum. So at optimum, just have to say that everything is at a maximum. Frequency of collisions and rate of reaction is at maximum. So that's point C. Now finally, we'll look at point D that is beyond the optimum temperature. What happens? So beyond the optimum temperature, enzymes begin to denature. It's an important word. We'll look at it more in the next slide. Begin to denature. And that's why the rate of enzyme reaction and formation of enzyme substrate complexes will decrease. Okay, it will just decrease. That's why the, the rate drops sharply here. Now, important note is enzymes do not die when the temperature increases very high and they do not melt. You need to use this word, they denature. All right, so learn that well. All right, but what is denaturation? Okay, denaturation is a change in the three-dimensional 3D structure of an enzyme. And the enzyme's active site loses its specific three-dimensional structure. It loses it. So here originally, you see the active site is this shape. And after denaturation, the active site loses its specific three-dimensional shape. And one consequence is that the active site is no longer complementary in shape to the substrate. So here, originally, the active site shape matches the substrate, but after denaturation, the active site is no longer complementary in shape to the substrate. You can use what we just discussed, uh, the lock and key model as well, to explain why enzyme activity decreases at high temperatures. So we already said that at high temperatures, enzymes denature, right? The active site of the enzyme loses its specific 3D shape and is no longer complementary to the shape of the substrate. So importantly, the enzyme can no longer bind to and act on the substrate. And that is why the rate of enzyme activity decreases. 
Alright, just look at this for a while, get familiar with it before our next lesson.